was instructed to design an even larger temple, but to make use of as much of the older temple materials prepared and on site as possible. This plan called for an eight column facade front um, and um, front and back with 17 columns along each side. The platform of the former temple would also have to be enlarged accordingly. And you can see the superpositioning of the previous uh, temple, six columns. Let me point some things out to you. One, two, three, four, five, six. The need to extend the, the uh, platform somewhat uh, to accommodate an eight column octa style, hexa style, octa style, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and 17 along the side. So uh, the name that may have been referred to the temple at the time of its construction would have been Hecatompedon, which is a word meaning a temple uh, in length of approximately 100 Greek feet in, in, in size. Um, the, um, to finance the, this, monument, the, this monumental project, Pericles confiscated a large portion of the Delos League treasury. This was a fund that had been entrusted to the uh, Athens by a number of surrounding communities for protection in time of war. And uh, he set his man to work. He ran into a lot of complications about that, but he got away with it. Pericles justified his actions by arguing that since the Persians had been soundly and permanently defeated, there was no need to maintain a defense budget. So by 447 um, BCE, the new Parthenon was under construction. No mortar or any other type of binder was used, but the blocks were so finely finished that each one fit snugly against the next top and bottom, side to side. Um, there, there was a little device they used, and I'd like to mention this, um, called anatherosis which means that when you consider the big surface of these columns lying one on top of the other, how much trouble it would have been for them to smooth down the columns so that they would fit flush together, uh, that you can almost not stick a knife between them. Well, they actually scooped out the interfaces of the columns so that the uh, only area they had to really worry about smoothing down was like a three or four inch circle around the outer edge. Uh, the rest was cut out and then there was a center pin put in the middle. And I suspect too that the way they ground these down was to actually rotate uh, one column on top of the other using emery, ground up this kind of type of sand called emery, uh, which would help to smooth these down. And we know that they may have done that because sometimes we find these columns unfinished with large bosses, big bumps sticking out on four sides, which would have been used by the animals to turn them around and rotate them on top of each other to rub them down. Uh, I think we have a couple of pictures that show some of the uh, process. Um, here, for example, you see an interior of the Parthenon uh, severely damaged as a result of the, the, the explosion that we'll get to a little bit later. Um, but you notice where you can see that they're still solid, how closely they fit together. And again, they use the uh, uh, anatherosis uh, technique uh, and other, several other devices to fit these all into place. I had to capture a few pictures to show what I'm talking about. Uh, here you can see, let me use the pointer, where the, these uh, blocks have been scooped out over here, just leaving uh, maybe a three or four inch edge uh, so that they would more easily fit together by sanding. They have li had little notches in them so that the guys could move them in place. These are two blocks deep with one block cro uh, crossing over. Um, bonding by placing one stone over the seam between two lower stones. Um, and uh, the idea of holding the blocks together, some earthquakes occurred in the area, and so they keep the blocks from shimmying since you're not using cement. They would cut little grooves, niches, going from one block to the other and install these eye clips or uh, cramps, as we might call them, made of um, iron. And uh, in order to keep them from moisture getting between the blocks to keep them from rusting, they dipped them in lead before they put them into place. Years later, when some restorations were going on uh, to replace some of the walls, the blocks, uh, they put in new iron clamps, but they did not put them into lead. And the result was that water got in there and started the whole cracking uh, procedure all over again uh, at a much later date by people who should have known better. 
but I digress. Um, another way of uh, taking the stones from the quarry nearby, Mount Pentelicus nearby, was to create wheels of this sort so that the blocks could very easily be uh, rolled. Uh, a lot of this is architectural speculation, but in many cases, it, it appears to be uh, a pretty um, a comprehensible answer to moving these large blocks great distances. And you can see the pin that would hold them. This is where the column or is going to be cut down. And other clever ideas, we can't ignore these. A device um, uh, here using a type of crane with little notches in the, uh, in the block or to lower a block down between two existing blocks to cut a U-groove in each side and then loop the rope through so that this block could actually be lowered down between two stones with a perfect fit. So how do you get the rope out? Well, you just unhook it and slide it out of the groove. Uh, pretty smart people. So um, during the final years of the completion of the Parthenon, the master sculptor Phidias was called upon to supervise the carving of the many sculptural figures for various places on the temple. The task was immense, and Phidias was placed in charge of a whole school of talented sculptors and artists who assisted him and worked under his careful supervision. Together, they completed the many figures, which originally filled the two pediments over the east and west facades. Some, some of these are more than 11 feet high and fully dimensional, carved on front and back. You, you might say, well, why bother carving the back if you, you can't be seen from below? The answer was the gods could see it and they would know whether they were complete front and back. A Doric frieze of 92 metopes, those are the little plaques right here that are sculpted, various myths that are represented here between the triglyphs. Uh, there are 92 of them and um, about four feet square. And uh, where we cannot see it, there's an unprecedented 525 foot long ionic frieze, which extended around all four walls of the temple inside the colonnade. And when finished about 438 BCE, the Parthenon stood 65 feet high, 101 feet wide and 228 feet long. Talking about the, here is the Doric frieze, the ionic frieze, you'd have to stand on the step and look up and it's right in here. And we will take a look at that all in good time as we come to it. And talk about decoration. The Pentelic marble was a beautiful white, shiny white. Um, but you can see that there was elaborate decoration in colors, generally using probably um, uh, an encaustic technique, wax, pigment mixed with wax. And then the wax was uh, painted on while still uh, liquid hot and then smoothed over with a, a warm iron to see that it would uh, absorb or cling to the, uh, to the marble. Of course, all of that deteriorated over the years, melted off. And the beautiful white pentelic marble um, has a large iron oxide content. And so over the years, exposed to weather, rain, uh, various climate factors, uh, it turned to a sort of a, a kind of golden brown. The, the steps in front here, um, was the place where often uh, shrines of various things, memorial to somebody who had died or somebody who had come and prayed to Athena for a cure of a certain illness and was cured. And so a little monument was put up here, uh, grateful to her for her intercession. Um, very typical uh, religious ideas of the time. So here we see a little bit more of a clarification of the painting uh, technique on the uh, Parthenon. The uh, metopes here, Notice that they're clothed. Um, there were often fixtures of brass or gold or whatever. You can see the wreath on the man's head here, a, a sword or a spear, other things which were uh, pulled out at later times. And we'll talk about that when we get to it. But here's the frieze panel, triglyphs and metopes. 92 of these on the, uh, uh, originally on the Parthenon. And inside, the, the idea of the temple was to house a mammoth, golden ivory statue of Athena, about 40 feet tall, which was a subject of great adoration by citizens from far and near. Each year, a ritual procession was held in the city of Athens, beginning at one of the major gates and proceeding through the business district of the Agora, uh, coming to visit the statue. Uh, the statue was uh, destroyed 
oh, I think about fifth century or so afterwards. But we do know what she looked like because Romans made copies of these statues such as it was. And uh, these were sort of like the little shrines that you can buy at different places. The Romans and the Greeks did the same thing at their time. And the, notice the snake and the shield. She was the military militant goddess Athena. Uh, the, the temple, by the way, was the, called the Parthenon, uh, Athena Parthenos, the, um, uh, the Athena the Virgin. The, uh, well, we'll see a little bit about the structure of the Parthenon when we get to that. So there was, uh, the, I mentioned this uh, big procession, and um, it, it involved uh, many citizens of the city, including soldiers, magistrates, horsemen, elders of the city, etc. That was to be the subject of the Parthenon uh, frieze. Uh, the young ladies involved in the ceremony, cows and hor uh, horsemen, uh, sheep were sacrifices and uh, gifts presented in honor of the goddess. Every fourth year, the procession took on a special uh, significance. At, the, uh, at this time, a ritual garment, or peplos, as it was called, was lovingly wrapped about an ancient olive wood cult figure of Athena, not the one inside the Parthenon, but one that was kept in a, another temple we will look at. Uh, and this olive uh, wood cult statue was said to have fallen from heaven and kept secretly hidden away. Uh, in one of the temples nearby. We'll, we'll take a look at that. Now here we're going to trace the Panathenaic procession uh, that starts way out here, comes through the um, uh, agora. Again, agora, agoraphobia. Anybody have agoraphobia? Fear of the marketplace, crowds in the marketplace. That's where the word comes from. Proceed through the agora, agora, and then coming to the entrance to the Acropolis, and we will see all of these parts in the proper sequence as we get there. So the fourth year procession was extremely uh, elaborate. Look, look at some of the recreations of what this area looked like. Um, so you would march right through here with the procession and up to the entrance here. Um, of course, all of this is uh, it's long gone. The uh, looking down from the Acropolis, you can see the uh, uh, Agora area, and the Hephaestion, which we uh, referred to as being the earlier type of temple, which is what the Parthenon would have looked like if they had uh, been able to maintain that. Um, now the story is going to take a bit of a sad turn. So with the passage of the years, much of the surface of the Acropolis was filled with other buildings, most of them temples and shrines honoring mythic kings and various gods and goddesses. Of all of these, only a few have survived, and even these are severely damaged by the ravages of time, but more so by the reckless conduct of humans. Um, the, uh, look at that beautiful painting that shows what this might have looked like. At, uh, at one. Notice, too, the, this is the area that we're going to visit called the Propylia, Pro going toward, and a big statue of Athena here. This is not the one that is inside the uh, Parthenon. This is one uh, that fronted uh, just as soon as you walked in, you saw this. And it was said that this, the glow of her uh, spear tip could be seen out to sea. Mount Pentelicus is back here. That is the quarry. Oh, here's the procession coming through the Propylia, delivering all their uh, the, 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 uh, amphoras, carrying wine, animals that are going to be coming through as well. And there's that big statue we just talked about, heading toward the, uh, the Parthenon. Um, the uh, procession is represented here. At last, we can see some of the Parthenon frieze, or the uh, the um, yeah, the Parthenon frieze um, that wraps completely around the building on all four sides. Some close-up details show horses. This is it from the uh, um, east end, which is uh, where the procession actually begins. It's very dramatic. Um, OK. With time now, I said that the uh, top level, the, the uh, platform of the Acropolis was filled in with various buildings um, that uh, will be taking a look at. There, of course, is the Propylia, the entrance. There actually was an art museum, art gallery right here. And there was supposed to be a sculpture gallery over here. It never was completed because some other uh, stuff was put up in the meantime. Right over here is a little tiny temple we're going to look at. We're going to see the one right here. 
and of course the Parthenon itself. So let's um, end the two big uh, theaters here. So this is uh, the Erechtheum. It consists of several connected chambers of various sizes, all in the Ionic style. And when we talk about Ionic as opposed to Doric, Doric is this plain, simple, like a dish sitting on top of a, with a, uh, like a flat board on top of it. Here we have little volutes. It looks kind of like a bicycle sitting on the top of the column. Much thinner columns, uh, somewhat taller, and the unusual quality of a porch that is made up of uh, uh, female figures. Um, the uh, one right here is uh, a copy. The original is in the British Museum, and we'll talk about that. Uh, the, the Greeks were not uh, pleased with the idea of having temples that were budding together, two or three different chambers like this. But as it happened that each of these places had some sacred connotation, each required a temple, and since they were very, very close to each other, that's what happened. Right in the area over here where you see the tree growing is where supposedly Athena and um, Poseidon uh, had a little competition as to who was going to be in charge of the Attic land. And uh, Poseidon had his trident, three teeth, trident spear that he jabbed into the ground and water spl splashed forth, seawater. Uh, not very good for crops. And uh, Athena instead um, touched the ground and an olive uh, branch sprouted out of the ground. And so the olive tree becomes the uh, important uh, symbol here and the olive branch, the symbol of peace. So uh, many stories that connect to all of this, but uh, maybe for uh, some other time. Um, here are the Karyatids, they're all females. Um, apparently the, there were women in a town called Karyas, I think, who uh, favored the enemies. Uh, and uh, consequently, when they lost, when that city lost, um, the women who had supported the enemy side were uh, represented in stone to their humiliation in the eternal job of supporting the architrave of this part of the temple. So, um, the tiny temple of Athena Nike is right here, Athena, the uh, um, victorious. And she also has a frieze up here. This temple has a frieze. And this is an Ionic frieze. The difference between the Doric and the Ionic frieze, Doric is metapetroglyph, metapetroglyph. Here it's a continuous frieze. And so this that becomes an Ionic. So the Parthenon is unique in that it has both a Doric and an Ionic frieze on it. And here you can identify Ionic from the little bicycle that looks on, like it's sitting on top there. Some repairs that are going on here. Um, of all the buildings that are on the Acropolis, the, the one that the people adored, um, uh, admired the most, is not really a temple. Uh, it's the entranceway, the Propylia, um, which had a, an art museum over here and the intention of having a sculpture museum over here. The, uh, the, the, the Athenians are very proud of this porch, to this entrance to their Acropolis, primarily for the reason that this was not built um, in the name of any goddess or deity or anything like that. It was built for humans and that this would be built just for the Greek people uh, was uh, admirable, just absolutely uh, thrilling to them. So this was uh, much adored. The doorway uh, here, I think we have another picture of the doorway here, uh, has an extra wide opening here. Look at the column spacing. This is very, this is a very big lintel over the top here. Um, but this is because when the procession came up here and proceeded going toward the Parthenon, uh, wagons, um, oxen, various animals, uh, coaches, various things that were brought up here, it had to be that wide to allow access uh, up onto the, uh, onto the Acropolis. On the south side um, below the Acropolis was the Theater of Dionysus seen of many Greek uh, dramas and comedies. Uh, of course, a few of these have survived into our own time and they're, they're pretty good reading. Um, and it's this area is used for plays and concerts to this day. Uh, and uh, the later period of the Odeon of Herodes Atticus, which dates from the uh, Roman time. And you can see that there is a, an orchestra arrangement set up down below and I think I have another picture of this that shows 
Yes, a very dramatic view. If you get at the top row and look out, this is what you see at the, uh, uh, the Odeon of Herodes Atticus. Beautiful. And the acoustics are marvelous because if you know anything about acoustics, sound waves travel in circular motion. So if you're right here and you speak in a theatrical voice, what we call a theater voice, you can be heard anywhere in the whole place. It's very, very good acoustically. Well, this then was the height of the classic age of Athens, the pinnacle of a culture which in an incredibly short time um, period uh, had uh, risen from the most humble beginnings to an unparalleled mastery in practically every aesthetic uh, endeavor. But this empire is, is, is going to soon suffer some very serious problems from this point on. This is a recreation of the uh, Acropolis and all of its buildings that you can find in the uh, uh, museum in, uh, in Canada, in, in uh, Toronto, the Royal Ontario Museum. Um, passage of time. Across the centuries, Athens fell to numberless invaders, Macedonians, Romans, Goths, Burgundians, but somehow the temples on the Acropolis were always spared any serious damage. Though their treasures, including the huge Chris Elephantine statue of Athena by Phidias, uh, housed within the Parthenon, was plundered and carried off in pieces. And in the sixth or seventh century uh, of the present era, we use the word Chris Elephantine. Uh, it's a tough word. It basically means that that statue was made of uh, sections of gold, which represented any of the uh, uh, armament, the spear, the helmet, things of that sort. And anything dealing with uh, Athena's complexion, her skin, or anything was made of ivory, little pieces of ivory carefully joined together. Um, and we know that uh, it was just an incredible uh, achievement. Um, okay. Um, the, the fourth year event of the uh, procession was also marked by what uh, we would call the Olympic Games, the fourth year Olympic Games. And when Christianity came in in the sixth or seventh century, they put an end to the Panathenaic festivals, to the Olympic Games, etc. And uh, all the temples in the Acropolis were converted into churches. So the Parthenon first became the Catholic Church of the Hagia Sophia, Holy Wisdom, and later the Panagia Athenotisa, or Our Lady of Athens. Athena Parthenos had become or been replaced by the Virgin Mother of God. In uh, converting the Parthenon to a church, an apse was added in the east end to house the altar, necessitating the removal of the east pediment sculptures, which were largely destroyed in the process. A portion of the east frieze, however, was carefully lowered to the ground and it survives to this day. The interior walls were adorned with Byzantine frescoes, and the coffered roof replaced with an ecclesiastical vaulting with additional windows. Uh, windows were also cut into the north and south walls along the roof line, which actually meant the destruction of small sections of the frieze, the Panathenaic procession frieze. The metopes along the north, east, and west sides were deliberately disfigured and left in situ as if to demonstrate the power of the new Christian God over the pantheon of pagan deities. Um, the um, South Metopes were left relatively unharmed with, since they could not easily be seen on the far side of the temple. And uh, access by ladders was rather dangerous because of the temple's close proximity to the st steep edge of the Acropolis Hill. Okay. Um, what we're seeing here is a time that uh, the, uh, the uh, Ottoman Turks uh, conquered Greece they took over the Parthenon and it became a mosque. And they even built a huge minaret such as we see here. And uh, uh, now the, the Ottomans were particularly nasty to the Greeks. They treated them as slave-like slave people. And uh, this is going to lead to some problems. Um, the view of the, uh, the castle from below in um, September of 1687, the Venetians, as members of the Holy League, united to halt the advancement of the infernal Turks. They overran most of the Peloponnese and besieged Athens. As director of operations, they had hired a Swedish uh, field marshal 
Count Königsmark. He was a student who had prepared a Latin thesis lamenting Athena's subjugation by the barbarous Ottomans. That did not prevent him on September 26th from ordering that a mortar barrage be aimed at the Parthenon in the hope of igniting the Turkish gunpowder magazine stored there. They had stored gunpowder in the uh, uh, Propylia here, struck by lightning some years before, destroyed that. But now they stored their gunpowder inside the Parthenon, assuming the Venetians knew about this building and would not fire upon it. They, it was a church at one time, but they did. And uh, the result is that going, there's going to be considerable damage. And we have some pictures of that damage. Uh, a lot of the metopes here uh, had been damaged by the Christians uh, in the process. The pedimental sculptures that you see over the top are going to be uh, brought down. And the Panathenaic procession, we're going to see what's going to happen to that. We've removed the front here to see the procession underneath. Look what it must have been like in the time that Phidias and his uh, artists had uh, completed it and painted it and decorated it. This actually is the beginning of the East. Here is where the procession actually begins, right here, going this way and then this way. And we don't know that they ever did this, but uh, they, they probably carved it in, uh, in situ. And uh, today, uh, a lot of the uh, friezes, uh, portions of it being completely restored, portions that remained on the temple up until fairly recent times and had decayed considerably have been removed. And in this case, they have been replaced by reproductions. So here is the mosque, possession of the Ottoman Turks. And here comes the, here's one of the metopes damaged. This is one of the uh, ones along the south side. A couple more views of the frieze in place. Here we see the barrage from the valley below firing on the Acropolis and hitting the Parthenon point blank. In the single battle, uh, the Parthenon was extensively damaged. The colonnade on the north and south side were just completely blown out. The roof just was distributed all over the countryside. Sculptures that were rather sensitively placed fell to the ground. The damage was pretty thorough. Of all things, though, the minaret, the minaret did not fall. So visitors coming to the uh, uh, Greece after this, this is what they had a chance to see. Now, here you can see the Parthenon completely gutted, although I must add that this whole section on the, on the uh, um, north side has been completely uh, replaced. Fairly recent, when I was there, uh, this was still not in place. In uh, one moment, the temple, not vastly changed from Periclean days, was irreparably damaged. Well, the irony of all ironies is seven months later, the Turks had retaken the Acropolis. So the siege, which had thus uh, destroyed this magnificent monument, had all been for nothing. Turkish destruction of the Acropolis continued in a variety of ways, and you have to take note of this. The disassembly of the temple of Athena Nike, its blocks of marble used to reinforce the walls along the entrance. In its place, a gun garrison was installed. Um, I think we have a, in this picture, the shading in this illustration indicates uh, blocks of occupied or ruined buildings divided by lanes. For a long time, the surface of the Acropolis was covered with Turkish hovels, many of them built with stones broken away from the shattered temples and reinforced with lime from burnt marble. Note also the apsidal structure at the east end right here. This is um, the, uh, where the, the uh, church uh, altar was. And in the middle here, is a mosque, a little mosque that was built in place. All of the rest of this is crowded with all kinds of hovels. Let's take a look at them. Look at this. So the Turks had no respect for the Greeks and, and they had no compunctions to uh, knock off pieces of marble, burn it in the fire and use the, the uh, to make a mortar to put up their hovels. 
And when visitors came um, with permission, they um, often took little pieces, they chipped away little pieces of marble for souvenirs. The Turks and men thought that they knew something about the marble, that maybe there was gold embedded in the marble. And so they did further destruction to the uh, Parthenon as it went on. Thirty years before this tragic incident, Louis the Fourteenth of France. Look at this uh, picture with a mosque in the middle. Uh, Louis the Fourteenth of France had sent a special mission to Athens to improve French relations with the Ottoman Turks. The ambassador, the Marquis de Nantes, was given special instructions to purchase um, ancient manuscripts and sculptures and to obtain as many drawings of important sites as possible. And for this last purpose, he took with him an artist who has been identified as Jacques, Jacques Carré. Uh, in the, let's look up close up, this is a detail of that painting, it shows the Parthenon and the minaret in place. In a remarkably short time of only two weeks, Carré managed to sketch both pediments, more than half of the entire frieze, and all of the south metopes, which were still in good condition at the time. This proved to be a very lucky occurrence in view of what happened to the Parthenon shortly thereafter. Um, these are carried drawings that are in the uh, uh, Bibliothèque Nationale in France. And because of the quality of his work, which actually was done from down below looking up at a very, very steep angle, uh, we can compare these to surviving fragments of the Parthenon. Uh, these are in the, in the, uh, either in the British Museum or in the Acropolis Museum. So these are carried drawings of uh, the, the one pediment in his time and what is there now. Notice the uh, metopes down here, shattered. Another carry drawing of uh, another half of a pediment and what remains. Part of the frieze that Carrie drew and what survives. This, this part has all been replaced in uh, um, a reproduction along the uh, one side. Uh, here we see an interesting thing, the, the, the charioteer here, and we, no one could figure out for a, long, a while in carry drawings what this was supposed to mean. This actually is an indication that there was a window here, that the Christians had carved a, cut a window through to bring more light to the inside, so they just cut right through the, uh, uh, the sculpture on the outside. And then this is the piece that we see there Notice the little holes here, which is where there may have been uh, reins or bridle or other fixtures, something over here, um, all torn away for the use of the metal for other purposes. These are some of the elders on the, uh, uh, just over the main entrance to the Parthenon. These are of course in the British Museum this is the section I mentioned that was uh, taken down whenever they were putting in a, the, the uh, Christ, Christian uh, section. This was lifted down and set on the ground and uh, thus it survived intact. So this is what it looks like in the British Museum. These are all the Olympian gods, by the way. Um, Hephaestus over here, Zeus, uh, various other figures. Carrie's drawings of the frieze are remarkable because they could so accurately depict portions that are lost. And so uh, it is possible through the existing fragments and the carry drawings and one or two other items that allow us to almost completely uh, re reproduce the whole uh, Panathenate procession. Uh, the two men that visited uh, Greece at one time, um, Stuart and Revit, uh, made uh, drawings that they reproduced uh, in engravings in the book called The Antiquities of Athens. And uh, here are two of their representations in uh, uh, these pieces, I think, are missing. Uh, when they were there, these still existed. They are now gone. That was about the middle of the 18th century. They refer to it as the Temple of Minerva. But uh, such awareness on the part of Westerners was not to come about for many years. Athens fell into a historical limbo for a long period. 
uh, and the Acropolis, tragically altered, became a kind of open air museum attracting artists, poets, a few amateur archaeologists, scavengers, and souvenir hunters, and those who were merely curious. Quite naturally, it became a sacred shrine for the romantic poets, such as Lord Byron and Keats, who often paused to reflect on the lost glory of ancient days. A revival of interest in the classical age of Greece occurred after the publication of the Antiquities of Athens, and many plays, poems, and even musical pieces were written, as, for example, Beethoven's Ruins of Athens. Another ambassador to Turkey, at this time from England, was Thomas Bruce, seventh Earl of Elgin. He left England in 1799, bound for Greece, and by 1801, had obtained permission from the Turks to remove whatever he chose from the ruins of the Acropolis. And his uh, desire to obtain marbles for his homeland, he was responsible for furthering the destruction of the temple. He spent vast sums of his own personal money on the project, convinced of the great artistic merit of the sculptures, and certain that his efforts would eventually be amply rewarded by the, a grateful nation. He had no idea what an adverse reaction the arrival of the Elgin marbles would cause in England. Uh, above, you can see here where the metopes have been cut away. This is where a metope would have been cut away and uh, set, brought down to the ground. Little by little, the Parthenon was just being torn to pieces. Now, when he had the marbles in England, uh, he was anxious that uh, Parliament would agree to repay him for all his expenses in bringing them to uh, England. The Elgin marbles for John Bull buying stones at a time, uh, his uh, numerous family want bread. And so there was a lot of ill will uh, about uh, Parliament paying for uh, Elgin's uh, activity. In fact, there was a guy by the name of Richard Payne Knight, who was what we call a dilettante. He thought Greek sculptures were very, very poor imitations that the Greeks, the, the Romans, were the real sculptors. And so he really maintained a movement against Lord Elgin. Uh, and long story short, uh, Elgin had all of these marbles in England. He had to move them around from place to place, Park Lane for a time. Then they went to the Burlington House where they were even stored, some of them were stored outdoors. Um, so after some years of quibbling, and still refusing to acknowledge the true importance of the marbles, the trustees of the British Museum reluctantly offered the almost destitute Elgin, Elgin a mere 35,000 pounds, less than half of their original cost. Um, 18,000 pounds were claimed at once by a single creditor and the remainder went to uh, uh, other expenses. He, he really was uh, broke. Um, The, of course, the real damage was done, but it is amusing that uh, the um, parliamentarian saying that the uh, Elgin marbles were not very significant um, and they paid, they shortchanged Elgin, who actually had to leave a country to go to France to avoid his creditors where he died of a very serious series of afflictions. But when they decided that they wanted to have a group portrait done of all, all the parliamentarians, the members of parliament, guess where they did it? They did in the space that they had turned over to the Elgin marbles. And so the story of the Parthenon goes on as it moves from uh, a crumbling temple, indifferently treated over many decades, subject in later times to the fumes of automobiles, air pollution, rain, acid rain, uh, any of a number of uh, terrible things happening to it. Some lovely paintings that were done, touched up a little bit, it, it would seem. And as we come into more modern times, the stereo cameras, stereoscopic images of the uh, the Parthenon and other buildings in, in uh, Athens uh, are taken. This is one half of a stereograph showing somebody had crawled up on the top of the uh, port of the Parthenon to take this 3D shot. Here too, you can see the columns that have fallen down and the anatherosis that would have uh, carved away the inner part of the stone here and the fluting. And these will all 
are all being replaced to the extent that they can. And when I was there in, in, during my time in the Navy, this is what it looked like. Uh, and, and this is back in the 1900s when these photographs were taken in as stereographs. In more recent times, very recently, in fact, a process of restoration has uh, finally been initiated. And uh, let me get, jump back here one. And um, um, trying to bring, the, not to, to completely recreate the Parthenon, but just to assemble back as much as possible. But if you um, want to uh, try to imagine what this would have looked like if this was still standing as it originally looked like when, when the uh, Greek architects walked away from it. The uh, east facade now undergoing restoration. The pediment over the top. Now you might be wondering, what are we looking at? Beautiful view. Th this incidentally is the view that when you entered the Acropolis, uh, the the um, Popilia is right here. So you're coming in. The procession did not go to this one. It went around here to this other side. Uh, over here. So you'll always see this as the photograph representing the Parthenon. It is not um, the, uh, the entrance to the Parthenon. Yeah, that's back here. But this is so badly damaged, this is much more interesting. So you're looking at the back end in all the photographs. Oh, look at that. I'm sure somebody out there is muttering that they know what this is. And if you like country and Western music, you might be Johnny on the spot. Here's part of the Dorpfeld Foundation visible. Okay, I'm not going to hold you in suspense. This is uh, the Nashville Parthenon. Back by, I think, 1920, Nashville was celebrating its centennial, and the decision was made to recreate a number of these buildings, including the Parthenon, uh, in, in plaster versions uh, after the big centennial celebration was over. Uh, many of the buildings were torn down. The Parthenon was kept standing. Uh, the people really liked it. And then rain and everything started to deteriorate the plaster. And it was decided to remake the Parthenon, only this time doing it in concrete. But they used a brownish concrete, thinking that's what it originally looked like. It should be white. But uh, here it is. There is the, the three steps leading up to the platform, the uh, bulging columns. So many things that have been reproduced here. And uh, very recently, um, she was given, uh, the, the real statue was reproduced here inside. Um, for the longest time, uh, Nashville being the Bible publishing belt in the United States, they opposed the idea of having a statue to a pagan god in this monument and uh, stood against it. But finally, they relented. And so Athena's temple now is, uh, is complete. And it is a beautiful place to, uh, to visit. The restorations now are going on, uh, proceeding, uh, cleaning up so many parts, um, replacing fallen columns, uh, re removing pieces that uh, can be replaced with copies. These are still some of the views of the National Parthenon. There is no plan to reproduce the entire Panathenaic procession because it would be so high up inside the building here that it would, there would be no point for doing that. Although sections of it have been reproduced on the inside. Um, so I believe uh, this pretty much ends our visit to the Parthenon, our study of the Parthenon. Um, it's taken us from ancient Egypt to Crete, to Mycenae, to Athens, and finally to Nashville, Tennessee, right here in the United States. So any, anyone who has fully appreciates uh, our tremendous debt to the Greeks, the story of the Parthenon is a tragic one indeed. We live in a modern age uh, and we like 
to think that the sins of past history cannot be repeated, that the damages suffered by the Parthenon were the fault of long deceased barbarians, that today we are civilized and that what we have now, such as it is, we have forever. But each new age brings with it a new collection of sorrows and concerns. The Parthenon, says the scholar R.J. Hopper, is a palimpsest of history. It is a battered remnant uh, com compared to its original state. But in view of the many vicissitudes of fortune, it is surprising that so much remains, surviving so many perils and still facing two more, the feet of the tourists and atmospheric pollution. Um, we're, we're blessed. I have to give a little nod to Lord Elgin here because he's taken a lot of rap on the shoulder uh, about uh, tearing stuff off the Parthenon, um, stealing from the Greeks. Um, the truth of the matter is, whatever his meaning, whatever his purpose, um, the, whatever he removed, would, what is left was subject to the Turks tearing it apart, damaging it, destroying, continuing the destruction, and many of the things that he took to what they wound up in the British Museum were rescued. One of the things that he did is a good argument to defend him is that he did make plaster cast of certain pieces that he could not take with him. This is a plaster cast such as it is in the British Museum. And here is what that part looks like today. Or at least since the beginning of the restoration. Here's another plaster cast. And the original. So we have Elgin to thank that these have been preserved. The question is, will the British Museum eventually release them back to the Greeks? Here is the restoration is in progress. Frankly, it's starting to look pretty good. They've cleaned up this walkway is all new. So much of this is very, very new. Look at this repairing um, a uh, capital by creating a piece that fits in to the broken fragment. Notice the little clips here, which indicate that this is where the metal rods were placed to hold the pieces together. Perhaps today, more than ever, the words of Stuart and Revit ring out with greater meaning and import than they did two and a half centuries ago when they were written for the final page of their monumental antiquities of Athens. Posterity will have to reproach us that we have not left them a tolerable idea of what was so excellent and so much deserved our attention, but that we have suffered the perfection of art to perish when it was perhaps in our power to have retrieved it. This is the New Acropolis Museum at the foot. No, this is, I'm sorry, this is the, uh, in the Duveen Gallery of the British Museum where the uh, Pan-Athenaic procession is shown. Oddly enough, it's sort of inside out because it should be wrapped around, not along the walls. And the hope is that if this is returned to uh, Athens, they now have a place for it. In fact, this is the museum in Athens, now open, beautiful catalog. It's actually built on the foundations of some excavations that they discovered there. And they had to actually put the museum on pylons to lift it up off the ground to reveal the uh, uh, excavated area below. But there, look, there's the uh, Parthenon way, way on the hill. And this is, is one of the places where they will put the procession. OK, thank you very much for your attention. I think uh, if uh, Dakota is somewhere around, she will. Uh, rescue me. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Um, as much as we would really love to have had you here with us at Lakeside, it's nice that you took us on this little international trip this morning. Um, there's a lot of things that I am glad that we didn't have a vocabulary test afterwards, but it's amazing to see its history. Um, we did have a couple questions come in, and a few of them you touched on briefly in your, your short um, 
photo reel that you had there at the end, but one of the questions uh, from David Blank is about the reconstruction and design. So are there estimates of the resources expended on design and construction of the Parthenon to the Athenian gross national product? Wow, uh, that would be hard to say. Things in Greece are, uh, even today, are not quite as stable and solidified as we would hope. Um, so I don't have any figures uh, on uh, the, the estimated cost. I suspect that um, it, it's going to go on for quite a long time, that they're going to need more money as time goes by, because e each time they do one major project, they find two others that, that, that have to follow up on that. So it's going to go on. Mm -hmm. And I can only imagine. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It, even even in the cottages that are 150 years old at Lakeside, it's such a process. You have to redo the roof, then you have to redo the walls, and there, there's a lot, I'm sure, as they uncover and start changing things um, and renovating more things that pop up. Oh, yeah. um, so then David also had, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was saying that kind of brings the Parthenon up to date right with Lakeside, doesn't it? It does. <laughs> you, know, you got to take care of things. Exactly. Um, and then he had a follow-up question, too. Um, so he said, during our visits to the Parthenon, we've noticed the very difficult footing on the pathways surrounding the building, uh, such as that if it had been the case at the time the ancient Athenians used it, I suspect that director of pavement would have been fired. Can you describe what the pavement around the building would have been like at that time? Probably uh, uh, stone, uh, and not exactly the, the pentelic marble. That would have been reserved for really important purposes, but uh, that they could cut stone and probably would have used stone. My guess is that in later generations with the Ottoman Turks there, whatever stone was available was peeled up and used to build their, their hovels, things of that sort. The, the Ottoman Turks were really bad on the Greeks. It's very, very severe. And they were there for, for centuries until Greek independence, I think in 1820, something like that, that they were finally, uh, finally thrown out of Greece. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, David, for those questions. And if, if anyone else has questions about today's program, this morning's program, um, Mr. Albacetti will be back with us again this afternoon here, not too long, and he'll be looking at a different topic about color theory. Um, again, going back to the world of art, but we thank you, um, MJ, for joining us this morning and for a wonderful presentation, a lot of amazing photos and history. Um, it may take some of our viewers some time to absorb it, but if you do have questions, um, I'm sure he would love to answer them later and we can get in contact with him. And I look forward to this afternoon. Okay, Dakota, I'm signing off.